Hello, everybody. This is NGO Soul and Strategy, and this is Tosca. I have a question. How do we nurture power for organizational integrity? That's the question we hope to address in this podcast today. I'm talking with two people who have thought deeply about this and who have made it possible for some international civil society organizations to experiment, to pilot with new ways of thinking and doing with regard to power for organizational integrity. They are Bavika Patel, who works on equalities and inclusion at Oxfam, currently Oxfam GB, and Alex Cole Hamilton, independent consultant, and together with others in a collective is behind the Power and Integrity Initiative. And by this way, we will also address in this episode how power is perceived in general and in our sector. This will be interesting, so let's get going. So with that, welcome, Bhavika and Alex. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. It's going to be really interesting uh, because you are you have started some really interesting work. So let me start with some, some bios. So uh, Bhavika first, she is currently the senior advisor, as I said, for equalities and inclusion at Oxfam, in this case, Oxfam GB, Great Britain. But she has also worked in other parts of Oxfam, Oxfam International. She brings uh, human resource, culture, and um, EDI experience with uh, uh, together with a practical uh, experience in understanding how power relates to EDI to um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and organizational ways of working. She has also led on human resource issues, um, as I said, in Oxford more broadly, and has been a talent advisor at UNICEF, amongst others. She has a degree in applied positive coaching psychology. I wish I could ask you questions about that too, Bavika, but we can't. And Alex, Alex Cole Hamilton is currently, as I said, independent consultant. She advises boards and executives on ethics and integrity issues um, and integrity risks and decision-making frameworks. Uh, she's the former head of ethics and compliance at Oxfam Great Britain, former head of corporate responsibility. And she also worked at the body shop on ethical trade. So I think... Um, Alex and Bavika, we have to start with a logical first question. Tell us a little bit about the initiative, Power and Integrity, as it's called. Why did you start this work as a collective and why now? Let's start with Bavika. Um, so thanks for having me here. It's great to be with you. Um, so with... With Power and Integrity, I joined a couple of years ago and I was really interested in how we look at power as well as integrity because our understanding of integrity is not necessarily a common understanding. And I felt um, EDI, equality, diversity, inclusion is a subject that's always been seen as an HR subject rather than an organisational wide mm. uh, subject where we need to think about the systemic problems and power challenges and um yeah to, to think about how we can affect the organization in a different way and um i was really interested by power and integrity and working in a collective uh, of change practitioners um is how we describe ourselves and it was really interesting to see how these different um various people of and from di various backgrounds were all working to, towards the same thing like a uh, sector level change got it. got it interesting a collective of change practitioners Alex tell me a little bit more um, can you expand on what Bavika said in terms of the origins the why and the why now and also um, can you talk to us a little bit what do you mean in the initiative by integrity because that's a fairly broad word and it's a it's a it, it's a it's a concept right let's let's bring it down to some some day-to-day -day issues so we we purposely chose the word integrity rather than ethics because i think historically ethics has been seen a bit like edi um, as an issue that sits in a team 
um, and isn't integral to how the organization works. So if we think of historically, you know, corporate responsibility in, in companies. Um, so integrity, just its its definition, um, you know, when you just look up a, a sort of a standard one is that it's whole and it's principled. And we were thinking about how does the organization think about accountability to uh, its mission, to its people, to um, the way it behaves, the way its people's people behave in a more coherent way. And the reason why we all came together to look at it was um, a few of us had been working on uh, organizational behavior, like what is the responsibility of the organization in terms of how it behaves. So that was in response to, you know, in, in 2018, a lot of charities were um, questioned about their investment um, decisions and the companies that they were investing in were those uh, in line with their campaign positions. And then others of us were looking at misconduct, particularly after the safeguarding uh, crisis in, in 2019 or 2018. And so a lot of organizations were looking at individual behavior and organizational behavior completely separately. And we wanted to bring them together because, you know, they, they are linked. So initially it was about doing that and looking at all the different, um, I, we call them integrity aspects that that organizations look at. And I think we've mapped roughly 20, but it's not comprehensive. But, you know, that would be from um, addressing uh, sexism, uh, addressing racism, but also looking at things like anti-corruption, privacy, safeguarding, um, gender pay gaps. You know, there's a, there's a wide range. And then we mm -hmm. also, in terms of are thinking about whole, we're looking at all the areas where they apply. So operations, supply chains, culture, uh, misconduct. And, and what we found when we were mapping is that the issues or, or aspects apply to multiple activities. And so we were really interested to find a more coherent and effective way of, of looking at all of this. That was sort of the beginning. And we felt it needed to sit at a strategic level uh, um, and that governance was the place to go mm -hmm. to uh, to bring that together. Yeah. Ah, and what you just said was very significant. And governance was the place to bring that together. <laughs> well, not to bring it together, but um, yeah, that m might not have been quite the right phrase. But what I mean is, um, what we what we were finding when we were talking to organizations that all these different parts of integrity were often because of. Uh, because of low budgets and not much money being um, available or time or space or even priority beyond delivering to the mission, a lot of these aspects of responsibility were shoehorned into the most relevant team. And then they'd report up to an executive who then had a fragmented view of all these different parts and then up to um, the board in fragmented way who did not have balanced view of all the different ways that the organization or the people that work or represent that organization can cause harm. And so what it meant was you'd have contradictory positions, you'd be sometimes focusing on the wrong aspect. And we felt that at executive and board level, we needed to enable the coherence which mm -hmm. would then reduce a lot of frustration for people working in the organization was mm -hmm. our hope. I yeah. got it. Right. Yeah. And uh, Bavika, so I read on the website that you are also, the initiative is also about how to nurture positive power. What is positive power for you? I think we've been looking at different um, models of power and our positive power construct comes from a, a transformative power, which is based on, um, Shri Lata Bhattiwala and um, um, other practitioners and and we feel um, positive power is about looking at how we think about um, the bottom-up aspect of revealing power so overarching we have uh, deep structures and systems that create um, um, disparity in power and experiences of power and so that's the systemic power the mm. the structural power like for example um, extractive capitalism we have as a, a system of oppression and so we we look at in as power integrity we've been trying to think about what's the deep structures the invisible power uh, the hidden power and the visible power and trying to look at how we can 
examine that in a different way. So our transformative example would be to think about how um, to just acknowledge that these social inequalities exist and that they exist. And so it, um, let's go back to, let's go to structural racism, for instance. It exists, mm -hmm. it's, it exists within our society. Um, we need to think about how we can decouple risk of harm to people. And we also need to think about our values and purpose uh, that that can stem from um, experiences of structural inequality. So as, if we've got that understanding, how can we look at the different ways of transforming that into a positive power experience? So if we assume organisations reflect societal inequalities, we can then be honest about the biases and we can become make the invisible visible. Um, we, we can create space and we can... Uh, people can claim their power rather than us sharing power, giving power. Um, and um, so the, okay. this claimed space is, feels like genuine and an invited space. And then thinking about the hidden uh, aspects of power, we show how we, we value how people are, are working as much they do they're doing what they say they're doing we believe them we trust them we increase accountability and transparency we make the hidden unhidden and we do that by cultivating humility listening and we create attention to those spaces um and then the visible formal um structures of power we we create policies and um rules or practices that that have clarity and enable that culture change that we seek so that we can walk the talk. Um, and for instance, like an example would be performance management would, will drive positive staff engagement. It wouldn't um, feel like a, you know, a negative top down mm. kind mm -hmm. of experience and what driving compliance would look different. And we would, we would do this in a power sensitive way. And we would look at how leadership can support that and looking at consequences and uh, sanctions that aren't um that are uh, rational or reasonable to to the circumstances oh that's when the rubber really starts hitting the road in those last couple of examples indeed um interesting and i recognize many of the concepts of sri lata as you say but liwala and uh, joe Rowland and others etc that that uh, have really had a lot of influence in our in our sector right um so clearly, um, Alex, this is comes amongst others out of a stance, and this is just a kind of a just asking you for a quick confirmation or or not the opposite. Um, out of understanding that nonprofits can also do harm, is that correct? Yeah, I think um, I think I think what's been really interesting is we've taken these well established. You know, you you've um, recognized a lot of the lenses that that Bav was talking about. Um, so these well-established lenses for understanding power and societal inequality, and we've turned the lens inward to look at the organization. And by doing that, we, um, and we'll, we'll talk to you a little bit later about a, a power lab where we did this with, with five mm -hmm. organizations, but, but by turning the lens inward, we, and, and thinking about how it applied within an organization, we actually came up with new language and ways of understanding that lens in an organizational context. So, um, so what we found was, again, you know, as with Bav's example, if we started with thinking about structural inequality and we just said, let's just accept that this exists rather than and it will reflect in the organization, no matter what you do, to some extent, it will reflect. And um, and that was kind of inspired by um, a shift that happened uh, with organizations looking at, at modern slavery in, in 2016. And with good practice, they said, if you're not finding modern slavery, you're not looking because it's there. Whereas before that, people were saying, oh, I wonder if there is modern slavery in supply chains. So we, we sort of inspired by that said, look, it's going to be reflected in the collective and individual cultures to some extent. So let's assume it's there. Then it's about, so it's about being honest about that and then starting to look at the beliefs that that um, often people are, you know, not even aware of those subconscious beliefs. So right. if I think about 
about gender. You know, par- I was in a meeting recently and uh, it was about hiring a senior manager and um, and they said, well, well, we can't have someone part time because they're just not serious. And and I thought, OK, so there's the gender pay gap again, because the assumption is if you're part time, you're you're not serious. And so women stay in lower paid roles. You know, that's a, a belief are not, that's so uh, deep. Yeah. Right, and are not um, eligible or will not be considered for promotion, etc. Will not be considered for promotion. So for this role, it was interesting. They said it has to be full time, and I just thought, wow, that's just cut so many capable people out of a senior role, and then that will impact um, women or or people in caring responsibilities actually impacting policy. Right. So then, what we find is the policy has blind spots, and the policy then reinforces the inequality that sits around the organization. So it's not just that organizations need to think about, oh, there might be discrimination. So it might be that a bad apple is causing harm, uh, which is often how organizations will think about it. I mean, there is an increased understanding that we need to think about inclusive culture, but but actually because the organization is uh, reflecting external inequalities, the formal rules that that organization works by will just reinforce those forms of oppression. So mm-hmm. um, so it was really helpful when we did that exercise with five organizations. And, and then Bav was describing when we flipped it and said, all right, let's imagine now, because power is positive or negative, you know, it's not. And how could we flip it and think about how transformational power can then look at these different layers and actually help create, you know, an organization that's um, that's power sensitive and and driving change. Mm, interesting. And so you said in the when I say you, I mean the the two of you, right? I don't necessarily remember who said what, but one of you said in the beginning, uh, linking individual behavior and organizational behavior, that's amongst those what your work is about, which it really uh, was something that, that stayed with me and that I, uh, so and you just said power is positive or negative. I'm going to ask you in a moment whether power also just is, meaning it's, it's, it's neutral. It happens. Mm-hmm. The question is, mm-hmm. To what ex- to what effect, right? Or with what intent? But we'll, we'll 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 get to that. And you may disagree with me. And I my view on power in intra organizational um, settings is maybe way too pedestrian for for your uh, liking. But w- we can we can uh, exchange around that. So let me. Um, well, I think we already talked a little bit about the. Did we talk sufficiently of uh, how to distinguish positive from negative power? Are there other things you want to say about that, either of you, Babaga or Alex? Um, I feel like there there are ways to distinguish the positive. I think maybe it's going back to that belief that things are neutral because Go um, ahead. In, in my belief nothing is neutral <laughs> in okay. and I, i've many um um colleagues here at oxfam um they talk about how systems and processes are, are aren't experienced as neutral they they are experienced in a, a society but, and let, let's talk about the uk for this instance a society right. that is mo- predominantly white um that has um working rules and um pr- procedures that are uh, dominated by that culture and therefore people who are let's say have protected characteristics who are do not fit the norm mm-hmm. uh, will experience uh, these normative professionalized practices differently so it's normal for someone but it's not <laughs> it's not, not normal. normal for everyone and so it therefore it's not neutral so you can try and do it something neutral um, but it won't be experienced as neutral for everyone. And that's a, an understanding that we, we need yeah. to take. Um, yeah, that's that. And I think that's totally fair. I think um, let's just let's just go there for a moment. Right. So what y- you were talking about because of societal and structural inequalities, how people um, experience what um, some people would um, say well power just happens in organization by which let, let me define power for a moment when I talk about and again this is a much more maybe pedestrian way but 
So when I think about power moves, particularly that leaders make, right, leaders, and when I say leaders, I don't just mean people with organizational positional power. I'm just, that could be informal leaders who are incredibly influential. That could be at all levels, right, people who are either inspirational or people who've had a long tenure, people who are examples for others, people who have a lot of institutional memory and therefore are turned to people who are nodes and networks and very important nodes, et cetera. So when I think about power moves like um, uh, jo uh, caucusing inside an organization for a certain purpose, right? Forming an, an informal coalition or caucus. When I think about um, ingratiating yourself with a leader who is above you in positional power now because you want them to do something that you can't do yourself, right? Um, when I think about blocking something or somebody. So these are examples of intra-organizational um, expressions of power that, whether we like it or not, are happening. Some people use these all the time. In our sector, we tend to be very, in my view, very insincere about talking about them, right? Um, uh, pretty dishonest. And because a sector has this uh, veneer of we are supposed to do good, that's kind of papered over. Some of these expressions of power are used to further the mission. Some are just used to further their team's budget or their ideological position or their own maintaining a job in the future, et cetera, et cetera. How do you... Is, is my perception or my that particular angle to intra-organizational power, is it fair or not to say that it happens? So as a leader, you better be capable of recognizing it and responding it, particularly if you perceive it as something that is not furthering the mission, but some form of self-interest. How how are you responding to that? I'm curious. I'm trying out a thought. I, with I, I've I've got some thoughts. Um, yeah, I think I mean power manifests in so many different ways. Sometimes it's hidden. Sometimes it's avert. And I think I think the examples that you give are a really helpful um, example of of how we don't have a common language in the sector around power. People are talking about it a lot, but we all understand it differently. And one of the first steps that that we want to really encourage is about helping create common language and understanding about power and integrity. With power, we've um, uh, adopted and in some cases adapted um, pre-existing frameworks that have been used to address societal inequality and, and conceptualize power. So, you know, we look at how power, you, you know, you've got power within, you've got power with someone. So the collective, you know, if we think about power of unions, for example, yeah. that was a very uh, good example of power with. We have power to something. So it's, you know, clearly to 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 an end. And then there's power over, which is that sort of more uh, directive, dictatorial form of power, which is generally what pops into people's minds, you know. Mm -hmm. And sure. um, but what's interesting is the power within, the power with, are really effective ways to start looking at transformational power, but also power to, and um, and power over. I mean, if we think about if policies are made, bringing in appropriate. Uh, or, you know, addressing the representation issues. If a policy is agreed, then that is, I don't want to say it's power over, but it is is—it is something that people should be held accountable to in yes. terms of ensuring the right decision makers are there and there's appropriate representation. So there can be positive and negative. And I think we can make huge steps as a sector if we start to understand power collectively. You know, we have common understanding. That would be my first thought on that. And the same with integrity. It's people are very confused. It's generally very uh, subjective. It, it links closely to people's values. And so, you know, one of our aims when we did our power lab was to really try to understand what do we mean by integrity in an organizational context. Yeah. Well, we got any, any things, any thoughts that came up with you as 
as I just brought up a different perspective. Maybe, and I understand now that your initiative uh, looks at things from different levels. But I wanted to try this out with the two of you. Any any reactions? Um. Yeah, I thought it was a really good example of how individualized power can be experienced. And I think it's more about what harm is being caused as those, uh, as you were saying those examples, what harm is being caused. Because if, if someone is having backroom decision making and not mm -hmm. involving others um, and they're doing it for their own purposes, um, what's the impact of those things? And mm -hmm. I think um, that's definitely power over. But mm -hmm. if, if it was done in a way that was like, oh, I'm seeing that these people are experiencing problems and I'm trying to help them and they're including those people in those thinking and in that thinking, it's kind of a different kind of power that they're using that kind of um, inclusive, uh, transformative type of power. Yes. The, and this is really what your initiative is is, is about, right? To Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the power lab. Well, sorry, that's my word. Let's talk about the labs that the initiative has uh, been able to initiate. Uh, Alex mentioned five organizations. So, uh, either of you who wants to start, what were they? Um, what have you and what have you learned? What did you pilot and what did you learn as as a group with the five organizations? Who wants to start? Alex, okay. I start? Okay. So um so we developed um we developed a set of four labs and invited organizations to take part in five organizations. Um we, we went through a process and invited five organizations with uh we the requirements were that there needed to be participation from uh board, executive, and practitioner level, at least three people, if not four. And it was four half days over a period of about five months, I think. And um, and we had four key themes that we looked at. First lab was really trying to understand what we meant by integrity. And we sort of developed a model that continued to develop throughout the four labs. The second one was understanding power and really looking at how we can adapt the power lens to uh, to looking at organizations. The third was looking at uh, leadership and power sensitive leadership. So mm. in particular, we'd invited executives and um, and board members because um, we really wanted to look at how um, how those roles can uh, can enable um, change in terms of transformational power. We wanted to explore that. Um, and we find often with boards, that's where there's the biggest gap in understanding around um, power and inequality, just because they're not working in program. You know, they often come from other sectors. So we, we were interested in that. And then the fourth one was really, you know, the context within which we work. We can't, you know, it's very difficult for organizations to, you know, when they've got all the external pressures of donors and regulation that, um, are at odds often with the organization being able to work with integrity and just understanding that a bit more and what needs to happen. So that was sort of generally the the format. And we finished them in March and we're just writing up the lessons which are going to come out in November um, in what we're calling an open source way. So we're going to share the models, the thinking and what we hope to do with it moving forward yeah i see and and be sure to uh send us the the links to to where the 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 open resource will be so i uh we can link to that in our show notes of course um and if right. you are writing a blog post or other public uh posts etc be sure to tag me and i'll be happy to cross uh, cross link that Alex, you said before we started recording that you wanted to make sure that at this point you wanted to explain the model. Did you feel that you had enough opportunity or are there more things you want to say about it before I move? Yeah, oh. so this is this is really what we introduced in the first lab, which was trying to understand what we meant about integrity. And so if you remember back earlier, I was talking about all those different aspects like safeguarding yeah. and all the different activities. So what we did with the five organizations is we mapped all the different aspects and activities of integrity for them. And I forgot to mention that we had two big INGOs, we had two very small UK organizations, and then a, a medium-sized one. And what was really interesting is there was a huge amount of overlap. 
And, um, but it also felt really overwhelming looking at, mm. you know, 20 different types of integrity okay. issues and activities. So we wanted to take a step back and, and have something we could, you know, work through scenarios and try and see if there were patterns between the organizations. So what we found was the activities naturally sat within three areas. Uh, and those were purpose, which is mission and values, uh, practices, which can be um, how you behave with partners, supply chains, operations, that kind of thing. Um, and then people, and that's uh, individual and collective culture, both internally, but also how you relate to people uh, that the organization has relationships with. So all those activities fetch um, fell within those three quite naturally. And so you have a typical Venn diagram with the meeting in the center. And then we tried to map all the integrity issues. And we found that most of them sat dead center because they linked to all three. So then, but, but when we worked through scenarios, what we'd found is a lot of those points of integrity had evolved in different parts and there was a lot of contradiction. So we saw a real opportunity for coherence in terms of how you look at human rights across the three, for example. It doesn't have to be the same approach, but it has to be coherent because, for example, you don't have as much leverage or negotiation with your suppliers as you do with what you do about your staff. You know, there's right. so it's taking that into cons but coherence is the key piece. So and then we talked a lot about how if one of those spheres, say purpose, becomes too big, thinking back to say 2016, you know, when the mission kind of trumped everything, sort of squashed practices and people, you know. So then we we talked and we found the same happened with all three spheres. And so then we talked about is integrity keeping the three in balance? Is that what it is? You know, so we played with that and we talked about kind of the pressure and pain that different events or external pressures put on those spheres that make it difficult to maintain integrity. Mm -hmm. um, so then from that, we we worked on, okay, but what is integrity? We still needed to figure that out. And that sort of, we looked at that through the next three labs and, and, um, and landed on three principles that we felt as a group worked. And one was that it's holistic. So thinking about those three Ps, um, the second is that it's justice oriented, which talks to the power work that we were doing in the next lab. And then it's also action oriented. It's not just about intentions, it's about acting. And that was where we brought in the power sensitive leadership. And that's sort of where we landed. And there was generally the participants kept referring to that model. It was a very helpful way for them okay. to think about integrity. I just want to turn to Bhavika. I'd like to hear a little bit more from you, Bhavika, around um, yeah, what what um, thinking back to the intent of the initiative, what and then comparing with what started to transpire, right? As 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 from the labs, what lessons do you and your collective take away about where you were? Um, well, in general, but also where you were right from the beginning and where you had to adjust your understanding about how to be relevant to the sector, in this case, the UK uh, sector. And we'll, we'll speak about that in a moment when we get towards the end of the, the recording. Um, sorry, that was a long question, so I'll yeah, try and... Yeah, <laughs> my fault. <laughs> no, that's so okay. Just any, any maybe start with any uh, uh, things that you took away in terms of understandings about power and integrity and any surprises compared to the beginning when you all started. Um, so I think it was really uh, affirming to understand that everybody is grappling with the same issues in terms of understanding power and integrity. It felt... Um, it felt like um, we were experiencing the same issues, but also not quite grap like we were having this uh, issue with language and not understanding certain terms and things like that. And that's not because um, not one person wasn't able to understand those terms. It's just like in their organization, it hadn't come up and so we felt like um, there was something that was needed to bring forward a common understanding of what we're trying to um how we talk about these things mm -hmm. um and it felt really important that we we should 
take that away as a sort of lab learning and also something that we can work on together and um, creating a common understanding um there are other bits um we also felt um there was um even though we were like bringing together five different really different diverse organizations um we felt there were some it, within those challenges of creating that common understanding we we realized that um, some there was diversity needed both of in, in terms of our collective as well our collective thinking we needed to develop that as well so um, mm. we recognize that the, this kind of goes both ways we need to see how we can work on that and develop that ourselves and so I think we're going to come go back and really develop that as a collective um, we also felt um, there was in some of the tools that we created there was real resonance of uh, using those in particular the power lens as I was saying looking at things from the bottom up how these systemic powers uh, sorry ex systemic um, inequalities exist and they're overarching it's not just EDI it's it's everything it's it relates to how we work in compliance in in risk in in people related issues all along those things and so that was really important for us to take that's away. where your work is really I think essential yeah um, thank you and then yeah I think there were a few more learnings but I think we'll, we'll be publishing those um as open source on our website and mm. I think it would be really good for, um to look at those because I think everyone will see something but um will resonate with them in terms of their organization Mm. And their organizational health even um mm. because mm. of uh, the the three p's as um alex described having those things in balance really creates uh i guess uh yeah an equilibrium of 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 just uh having a, a more positive organizational experience for all um yeah and may i ask both of you i don't want to put you on the spot so please answer in any way that you feel comfortable but what did you find in, across the lessons from the lab? What did you find most encouraging in terms of what you try to influence? And what did you find most frustrating or, yeah, that left you, yeah, frustrated uh, or mad or, yeah, yeah, the, the word frustrated comes up to, for me. So maybe starting with you, Bavika, what most encouraging, what most frustrating and what you observed in the lab? I think it was, um, I think uh, the positive thing was the connection. I think none of these uh, NGOs had come together to work in such a different way and uh, to workshop together to think about different um, concepts. And, and it, I felt that connection was really important because they could see this really large NGO was having the same issues as this really yeah. small NGO. And yeah. it felt like that common ground was really um, well received and well like um appreciated and i think that was really a nice positive experience um my i guess a frustration was um um not everybody is um on the same position uh, in terms of their learning journey in understanding certain concepts like um structural racism or um uh, um um yeah lots of different concepts so there the, the, there are many systems of oppression I think some people have experienced uh, some aspects but not all and that's that's really hard you know unless you're a specialist and uh, you know working on these things every day you're not going to know these things and that's totally understandable especially um, for white people right like myself yeah and I think it's I think it's what we don't want to do is stop encouraging people to learn. I think we need to meet people where they are and try and encourage them to go further. And part of this work is really uncomfortable. It's challenging and we need to accept that. And I think on both sides, that as a, a facilitator or a, a person that's supporting this um, learning and challenge, or even as a coach, I would say, I, I feel you need, you need to meet that person and you need to take that per person on it at certain steps to get them to where they need to be um uh so on a group level that's 
uh, that dynamic is quite varied and so you mm. have to go with like uh, you know when you're doing a hike you have to go at the pace of the, the slowest walker right um <laughs> so it's it's the same concept like you have to meet people at the basic level before you can move forward and I think that's beneficial for everyone even if 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 you are at the basics there is always something to learn yeah yeah that's right and I loved how you linked it to coaching that's uh yeah Alex anything we're almost at the end but uh anything on either what you found the most encouraging thing you observed in the lab and the thing that you are most find most uh frustrating in terms of what's possible in terms of actual influencing for instance that how the initiative can influence practical practices <laughs> no pun intended of organizations yeah. I think, you know, it just was really, really clear that the way the sector is structured, it, you know, it's very difficult for organizations to to move forward. And we need the same kind of work to be happening within. So we're looking generally at the UK context. but And I know there's a lot of work on um, looking at decolonization in the international um, context, but certainly within the UK, um, it, it, we need to have conversations with the external pressure. So is that donors, regulators, uh, but also the media. And so it just feels very big <laughs> in terms <laughs> of, you know, um, and and so I think for us, we, we've recognized that, you know, a, a key part of our work is going to be kind of cultivating um, or not duplicating, but, but working, finding allies to work with to create the bigger movement in the sector. It's just too hard to try and do this in an organization. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. but but in terms of feeling encouraged, I um, I loved hearing people refer to the power lens and the three Ps and putting it into action. And f you could, you know, all of us, the pieces were coming together and we were changing our language and we were sharing language and, um, yeah, just just to throw an exciting stat, like, you know, 90 percent of participants agree that understanding power will enable organizations to work more coherently and uh, on a achieving or working towards organizational integrity. And that was very heartwarming because that was our hope. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it was Definitely. tested in very different concepts in, in different contexts. So, yeah. That was yeah. that was really nice. Yeah. And, and so the fact that your realization, Alex, around the, these larger factors like media regulators, donors, etc. So the fact that, for instance, the R Ringo initiative is now focusing this coming year on two actors, right? Boards and on funders is is a is probably a very appropriate next step in, in your opinion. And I'm assuming that you keep kind of informing each other nurturing each other as you both go along right so with that we have to bring this to a close so let me ask you uh starting with you uh Bavika, if people want to find out more about you and the initiative where should they go in both both these things i'm asking you a, again a double question i apologize no worries um uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn personally for my personal profile there. Um, and you can find more about uh, Power and Integrity um, on our website. Um, and that's a key place to find a lot of information on the learnings. So we will link that to both of these in the in the profiles. And for you, uh, Alex, where would you like to be reached? Same. So via the Power and Integrity website or, um, yeah, by LinkedIn. And Power and Integrity is building a LinkedIn page and presence. So that's you can search for us that way as well. It will be coming up soon. Well, this was super interesting. And I'm so glad that you and others in this collective have started this initiative and will be excited to see what comes out when you have written up the 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 lessons from from the lab and where you will take it next so uh, i hope you'll keep me on your your uh, email list for that so with that thank you bavika and alex for all your insights and thank you listeners um, if you found this podcast um, episode stimulating i want you to know there's a couple of other episodes in the podcast where we also talk about power, such as, as well as integrity, ethics, and other what I call real in use uh, practices uh, in the sector, such as episode 24, in which I did interview Alex, as I said before, on 
similar topics, but when this initiative was in, in a much earlier phase. Um, and in addition, in episode 46 and 54, we're also talking about organizational integrity in our sector uh, with other um, uh, key thought leaders um, on these topics. So I encourage you to go there if this is of interest. All of these things you can find on my website, fiveoaksconsulting.org. That is with the number five, but also on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to my email list and you'll be the first to know when this episode comes out, as well as many other pieces of content. And with that, this is Tosca, and I look forward to talking with you next time on NGO Soul and Strategy.